Hello, everybody who can hear me. My name is Václav. I am the uh, music director of uh, the cultural center Meat Factory in Prague, which is uh, a host of this wonderful session with the uh, wonderful Sylvie Simons. Thank you for joining in. I just wanted to um, make a point that uh, I would like to ask you guys to stay muted until Sylvie goes goes through her talk and at a certain at a certain moment she will request questions and then you can you can jump in when, once you once you want to ask something so i feel like Sylvie if you feel comfortable let's let's start and i will i will let people in when they request the access to the session if they come late okay that sounds perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Enjoy. Thank you. Well, hi, everybody. Um, wherever you are, I'm Sylvie Simmons. I'm in sunny California, cold but sunny California right now. And I'm a music journalist. I know it sounds a bit like an Alcoholics Anonymous confession, but I've been one for more than 45 years, it's been pretty much my only job throughout my entire adult life. The other job being a singer-songwriter, which I became in my 50s. So basically, I've lived my life with music, writing about it, writing it, and playing it. And it was, and still is, um, a great life. If it sounds like I'm dying, it's because I woke up with a cold, but... Forgive me, at least I'll have a voice like Mary. I'm faithful by the end of this day, I think. Um, maybe I'll start with how I became a journalist, music journalist, a rock writer, and why. You know, it's funny, uh, in the early days when I started in the 70s, one of the first people I got to interview was Frank Zappa. I was a big fan of Frank Zappa. He was not a big fan of music journalists. He and Lou Reed were probably the least pleasant people to music journalists I'd ever really met. But what Frank Zappa said, he said, like writing about music, which was what I do, was like dancing about architecture, by which he meant it was completely and utterly irrelevant. You don't dance about architecture. You don't write about music. He also said something that I heard quite a few times over those 45 years, which was that all music journalists are wannabe musicians or worse yet, failed musicians. That cliche, actually like a lot of cliches, does have a little truth. I know a lot of people who are so obsessive about music that they become music journalists because that is the number one qualification to be a good music journalist. The people who are obsessive about music often play music and maybe at home at least they're, they're a kind of rock star when they look in the mirror. Some of them have side bands and have had even very successful bands before they've become, uh, you know, before... The, well, I'm not really quite sure where I was going to go with that one, but they, they are really so into music that the fact that they play music is, is really kind of irrelevant. But in my case, I guess I was a failed musician. I had decided in my teens that I was going to be a singer-songwriter on the basis solely that I owned a, a very nice, famous jumbo guitar that I could play a bit and I wrote some melancholy songs and I looked cute when I was at that age. And so uh, I went and did a show. It was very local with, you know, maybe six people in the audience. And I was so frightened that I just froze and all that came out was eh, which will probably come out quite a few times today because of the bad cold that I have. <laughs> But I was a practical girl, and so I also loved writing. It was the other thing that I adored from beside music. And so I decided, again, on the basis of nothing, of that I would be somebody who wrote about music. You know, 
I kind of had, in a way, the qualifications of a music journalist in that even though this was at a time in London where I was born where you didn't get very easy access to music or information about it, or at least the music that I loved, which was largely rock music. You didn't have much of that going on back then. In the 60s and 70s, while I was growing up, there was this great kind of musical, what what you'd call it, it was just this explosion of great music that came along every day, starting with the Beatles when I was a little girl, and going through all the great British bands like, you know, the Stones and the Who and the Kinks, et cetera, et cetera. And I would do what little jobs I could to make a bit of money to buy 45s because I couldn't afford the LPs. And I would go to record shops and just like stare at the albums and read the credits on the back and all of the liner notes that I could read. But the big thing, the biggest influence in my life was these four magazines, four music magazines that came out every week in England. It's hard to imagine now there's so few new magazines around. There are some, so I'm not complaining too much. But back then there were these four weeklies. It was NME, New Musical Express, Melody Maker, Sounds and Record Mirror. I couldn't afford to buy them, though they were cheap and printed on that kind of like cheap newspaper kind of paper, which made all the inks come off in your hands. So we used to call them the inkies, the weekly inkies. But the people who wrote these, they weren't doing the kind of publicity related music journalism that I hear so much now. It was people who had an obsession with one part often of the music business, like when the punk scene came around, there'd be people who wrote that. There would be people who were obsessed with some sort of whatever it was, progressive rock or whatever. And you came to really treat these magazines, or I did, as like biblical scrolls. These were sacred documents that were given to us by these music journalists. Most of them were men. I you know, hadn't realized when I decided to be a music journalist that a penis would have been a good idea. But um, hey, times have changed. And there were women at that time writing. But I had sort of thought, I need to be one of these people. I need to be able to talk about my obsessions with music and what I love and use I don't know really why I thought that I could be such a good one, but I wrote to the all of these a letter. These are free email, I wrote a letter to each of the magazines and I told them I wanted to write for them and none of them replied. Of course they didn't reply. I mean, I had no experience at writing about rock and it's that frustration for any of you who might be maybe thinking of finding a job is that you kind of need experience to do it, but you need the job to get the experience. One of the changes these days is that's not so important because you can start your magazine online and you can blog and you can show that you can write something that you saw an example of something that you can write. But I got in touch with them and they didn't have any interest in me, but my interest was still there. So I just scoured every newspaper I could, every music paper, and I found an ad for a job. It was a kind of virtually unpaid, very underpaid uh, job short term of writing for a girl's pop magazine. Now, this wasn't really my ideal job. Certainly, it was a job for a girl, you know, and I wanted to be with the boys in music journalism, talking about how this culture that we had was so of music was so, so, so important to who we were and what we believed in and how we conducted our lives, et cetera. So I did this job though, and I was sent to interview people like the Osmonds and uh, the Bay City Rollers, if anybody remembers them. The one time David Bowie, but I was to ask them questions about 
what kind of girls do you like you know what do you do for hobbies this was really not my thing but it got my foot in the door as the English put it what it did was it gave me access to the music business because the music business is looking for people to publicize their bands it's not the unknown people that often were being written about in in uh, the rock magazines you know they weren't so interested necessarily in the big names at the time they wanted to find something new and and really you know be much more courageous and open and independent in their writing but I went into these interviews and because of that I got to know a lot of people so if you do get your foot in the door and you want to be a music journalist don't go home and spend your whole time becoming the writer of the pervy article you know get context get to know people who are in that kind of business I got to know a lot of record company people and I met a photographer who was working for various American and um, and European magazines uh, his name was Chris Walton and he had been taking photographs of the Beatles like when I was a little kid so I got, you know, I was really fond of this guy talking to him and I'm getting his stories. And he said, well, you know, when I go and do the interviews, uh, sorry, the pictures, why don't you come and interview them and write something and I'll send them off to the magazine. So this was a brilliant start. But, you know, when my little job ran out with, uh, with the girls magazine, the teen magazine, um, I bought a one-way ticket to Los Angeles I think these days you need to get a round trip because of you know immigration things but I just bought this ticket and I turned up and I thought this is it I'm going to be a rock journalist I went to LA rather than New York which would have been a lot nearer because well I'm from London and I wanted the sun <laughs> I was obsessed with the idea of searching for the sun but also I also had a kind of a bit of a secret love for the Laurel Canyon scene of music, you know, the Joni Mitchell and the Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, which at the time was despised by the UK press because it was considered old school and mainstream. And, you know, they wanted punk and punk was, of course, absolutely brilliant. But I had that side too. So I, I turned up in, um, in LA. And one of the first things that I did out there was find out where the record companies were and go and introduce myself, you know, call them up on the phone, pop over and see them. And at that time, this is in the, uh, this was 1977 when I went out there, summer of 77. And uh, at that time, the record companies were big. You know, they had money, they wanted publicity, they worked very closely with magazines and music magazines. And it was quite easy, much easier than now to get access to, to bands or artists you wanted to speak to. So I introduced myself. I said, here I am rock writer and I'm in LA. Great, I'm a correspondent. I didn't say for what, I said I'm a freelance, which I have always been. And they all telexed their counterparts in the UK. There's some strange Morse code, I don't know, it was, way beyond even fax machines it was so long ago in the world of technology and they said yeah she's she's a published writer she's been writing about music so the uh first thing they said to me was uh oh we have steely dan coming into town do you want to talk to them and i said yes please i just kept saying yes please so i got this interview i have an interview now i even took their pictures they were so sweet to me and sarcastic at the same time. I think they were rather amused at having a young woman talking to them as opposed to the usual long line of male journalists. And uh, so I called up New Musical Express and said, hey, I've got the this great new interview, do you want it? And they said, no, we're not into American music right now. And I called up Melody Maker. They said, oh, we've got a correspondent. And the next one I called was Sounds. And Sounds said, yes, send it. And again, back in this historic time <laughs> of my youth, 
you put it in an envelope and put a stamp on it, an airmail stamp, and it would get there a week later. And so about two weeks after that, um, my story was the cover story on sounds. And it didn't stop from then on. It turned into having, um, like doing regular interviews for them several times a week, doing reviews, doing a column, which meant going to all the parties. And there were many, 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 many parties and having free access to pretty much all of the shows. It was um, an absolutely brilliant time with so much going on. Among the people that I would talk to in the beginning was I, I went to Michael Jackson's house and spoke to him, ended up interviewing him a few times. Um, I remember in 1978, it must have been, uh, Sounds sent me on the road with um, Black Sabbath. So you're on the road with a band. It's like, like it was pretty wild. And there, uh, at the time, it was the year that they were about to kick Ozzy Osbourne out. So he was in a very emotional state. And there was this brilliant new band just out that was supporting them, which was Van Halen. So, of course, I wrote about them, too. So all of these things were going on. The year after that, I went on the road with The Clash. It's hard to even remember. It's just so many artists from famous people to people who really didn't have a record deal when, when you met them. And they got a record deal as a result of what you wrote. So there was a very close, sometimes hostile, but symbiotic relationship between the rock writers and the uh, artists, which disappeared, I guess, over time now where I've been finding in recent years, it's quite hard to get access to some of these artists. Um, they're a little bit more private than they used to be. But, you know, if you've read any of the books or um, seen any of the films about you know, music journalism, like, uh, you know, I'm with the band book or with uh, Almost Famous, you get an idea of quite what it was like. You just kind of, you just had, as I say, this passion. You talked about this music. You wrote about it and all of the kind of wonderful things that went along with it. And back in the 70s, it, that was the way, that, there wasn't much other way of finding out about music. It's almost impossible for me to be articulate about it now, because now you just go and look on Wikipedia, or you look up something, or you go and hear it. But that wasn't there. It was the music papers that were the people who introduced you to the music that they thought was important and told you why. And also in no uneasy terms, told you the bands that you weren't allowed to like, which could sometimes get a bit funny. They tend to be much loved now in history. So that's how I made a start in it. And um, I'm going to have a look at some notes now in case I'm starting to ramble. And I will see. Yeah. Here it is. Um, I was kind of thinking as I was writing these notes about what I might talk about, about probably the most important thing about being a music journalist was this kind of sense of integrity. You know, you didn't really have much love for anybody who was just doing stuff for money or doing it because, you know, they wanted to so you got the free trip, whatever happened, even if you said bad things about the band, but you were doing it just for the free trip. People had this integrity about what they believed in the whole time. And it kind of reminded me how as when I was putting out my second album as a singer-songwriter, there was this online magazine that does have a name. I'm not going to name it. I don't want a lawsuit. But um I sent them, or rather my record label sent them my album to review. And I got an uh, email back from them. I don't know who was, somebody at the magazine, to see if I wanted to pay them money to be one of their best songs or best albums of the month that they put together, a kind of mixtape of this. And I was, I was filled with a rage. I don't think I felt for the longest time other than political things, it was this huge rage upon me of how 
day. You are a music magazine. This is meant to be music journalism. And you are saying that you're choosing what is good music on the grounds of the musicians pay you. So I wrote back and told him I found him unethical and nauseating. Um, still do thinking about it now. And uh, they did review my review. They didn't give it a great review. I'm sure I would have got more than three and a half stars if I'd have paid them. But that to me is one of the kind of sad things about how some music journalism has tended to change and why I think it's important that if we're going to talk about the future of music journalism, we need to make sure between all of us, between the artists and the writers, that this is something that is decent and good and ethical and has heart and soul in it and balls, I suppose, whatever gender you might be. And I remember something else as well. There were Rolling Stone at one point before they put their uh, Rolling Stone magazine, before they put all their content behind a paywall to make money, put something up that was about you could actually pay to write for them. <laughs> and that almost made me laugh because, you know, music journalists, generally speaking, do not make much money. They don't. There's, it's just a wonderful way of life. And certainly when I started in it, there was ability to make that money, mostly because well, all sorts of things were going on. One, you used to get sent solid copies of LPs and CDs. If you didn't want them, you could sell them to a record shop. It was called like the bank of LPs. Or you could put articles in for syndication and have it printed in another country. You could write for several magazines at the same time on the same with the same interview. All of these things kind of started to dissipate when everything or almost everything went online. My main regular magazine that I write for right now is... Um, Mojo magazine, you can probably see on the shelf behind me all of the issues. I was there since the very first one in the 90s. And they do not put their content online unless it's, you know, somebody is paying for it. So they've kept up the tradition of print journalism, which I love. But of course, oh, can you hear the sirens? I think it's the, <laughs> it's the thought police coming after me. Um, that that these are uh, these will probably will become extinct at some point because quite often the content that they have isn't all about new artists. Quite often it is about uh, artists in the past. Though it is really interesting to go back to that culture and look at it. I mean, it's a strange thing. This idea of everything has to be constantly fresh the whole time. It's something that has happened with the internet that. If something has, you know, a hit has been a hit for one day, it's gone. There isn't this feeling of that something can be around. And to me, writing about some of the albums that came out 50 years ago and just having their, you know, their anniversaries, it's wonderful to come at them from a different angle and from a different age and, and time in the same way that it would be examining paintings 50 years after they were put up, you, people don't not talk about a painter or a great novel because it's already been out for a week. So anyway, I, I was going to look at what I wrote down here. I've made some notes. I've put the first quality you need to be a music journalist with a lasting reputation, which I guess I have, is integrity. But I thought if this is a workshop, I should say, how do you become a music journalist? Right? So part one, most of the rock writers I knew hadn't taken any kind of university class in how to write for a rock magazine. I don't think they even existed back in back then. I know they do now. Um, it's probably where some ex-rock journalists are managing to make some money, so I won't complain about them. Actually, I think only a couple of music journalists who were my peers back then, you know, who were writing as long as I did or even longer, even took any kind of degree or classes in journalism. 
what you needed, as I've mentioned before, was this kind of passion for and obsession with music and its importance, whatever type of music that might be to you. You know, for me, it was rock. It's also encompassed folk and country music, but hasn't gone into some other areas. Also, if you're looking for work as a music journalist, I would say that you should read everything you can in any music publication that you can find. Read them. It's the police again. <laughs> uh, read them over and over and over. And I'll tell you why. It's to see what they are missing. See if you can find what they're missing. Because right now, the way of getting in is to find a niche. In a way, I guess when I went out to LA, I found my niche. It wasn't like, hey, look at me, I'm the only girl in rock writing, because I wasn't. There were women writing about music. And most of them seemed to be on the magazine that I was writing for sounds. There weren't many, but there were some there and good writers too. But my niche was that by happy accident and because of my love of the sun, I was in LA where there were millions of movie journalists, film journalists. It was Hollywood, you know? And the music journalists all seem to be in over in uh, New York or in Nashville. So you need to find a niche and your niche can be whatever it is. Maybe it's geographical, that you happen to live in a place where there's some new scene coming up. Who knows? I'm not living in every part of the world. I mostly am doing this from an Anglo-American point of view, born in England and also lived half of my adult life in America. But wherever you are, there may be some scene coming up that people need to know about, that you want to tell them about. So you could do that. Also, something that's happening now, people who are living in different, more fluid genders or people who normally you wouldn't see as the average rock writer at a press conference or a series of interviews on interview day at some hotel where we all go in for an hour and come out the other end and the next one goes in. So that's something, just devour this so you can find where you fit in, why they need you, where you're missing. And however you get your foot in the door, turn every opportunity into finding a contact. I mean, don't be obnoxious. Don't like constantly badger people all over Facebook or write about your brilliance. I know that's the new way now, but it can get a bit jarring, but just find kindred spirits, you know, find who they are. And so instead of sort of sitting at home waiting for like, if you do get one piece in, don't sit at home waiting for the editor to call back and say, what else can you do? Let's do this because most of the time they're waiting for you to come up with the idea and pitch it. Or it's a sort of, I guess in my life now, it's a kind of dance, a choreography between an editor wanting me to do something and interview somebody and me suggesting I want to do this story. And then you get together and make some kind of compromise over it, as is what happened with a piece I did in the December issue of Mojo, a big piece on uh, Tom Waits, an artist. I rather love. And also important, I guess, is, you know, on a financial side, when I, when I became a music journalist, I was basically for the first six months, I think I had like two pounds of carrots and one burger and a sausage to last me about three months before the first bit of payment came in. So it's not something that you're going to immediately, unless you're very lucky, find a paid role in so find some other way to support yourself please but unless you want to be skinny you know it's good you don't eat too much I guess so let me see what else have I got on my list here okay um when you have your first assignment I'm imagining you've got through all of this part you've eaten your two sausages a week that you got left and what Five things you need to know about music journalism. I was remembering something that one editor from a magazine that I write for always says. And he said, he said that about artists you write about, they are not your friends. 
actually over the years some of them do become friends because you know every year an album comes out you see them and some do become friends but I know what he means it's in there you're not going in there to get your selfie with a famous person you're not in there to be their pal and get their autograph that's kind of not going to really get a great interview from them what you're in there for is to write a true account you know truth I know that there's all sorts of exaggeration and hyperbole and language like that in rock journalism and I've been responsible for a whole bunch of that too but at the basis of this there's still a truth you are telling your truth about it um you know sometimes that takes courage you'll piss them off you'll piss your editor off you'll piss the readers off I mean there's all these things I've pissed off so many rock stars in my life but then maybe a couple of albums later they like me again because I've said something nice and also even if you haven't trained as a journalist you are a journalist you do not make things up no no making things up you're given a story you tell the truth you write what you see as I say, it may not be pleasant. It's your duty in a way to do that. If you want to be a really good music journalist and say what is going on, the good, the bad, and the ugly, but you tell the truth. If you want to make stuff up, write fiction. Um, in the 90s, was it? Or the end of the 90s, I wrote a book of, of rock fiction, cult fiction, called Too Weird for Ziggy, in which I told some stories where I could make it up because, you know, it was good good to get that out of my system. Let's go back to my list. If the article you're doing involves interviews, the most important thing is research. Research, research, research. And these days, it's not as hard for you as it would have been for people who were writing back in the 70s like I was because you got the internet. But do not just go to Wikipedia. No, no, no. Wikipedia is wonderful. Love it. Fantastic. I'm on it. I didn't put mine up, honest. But um, just everywhere. Just think of things that you, you want to know about them. Because, you know, what makes for very bad journalism, I've found, is that people aren't getting to the truth of things, as I mentioned before. And the best results to get the artist to open up to you is if you kind of know more about them than they know about themselves, put it that way. You don't ask kind of a what would be a dumb question. I do remember once going to a press conference in London. Oh, no, it was in L.A., I'm sorry, where a woman, I don't know from what magazine or newspaper she was from, would ask the subject of this, the person who was giving this uh, press conference was Eric Clapton. And she I said, what instrument do you play? So, yeah, there's some pretty bad journalism out there. OK, I guess how do you get to people to interview in the first place? This goes back to my thing about having your little niche. You have some access to interesting people that you want to write about for whatever reason. If it's um, a big star, woo, that's a bit harder. You could probably give me tips on that these days. Some of the PRs right now are more about brands and everything than they are about getting journalists and the artists together sadly to say but the uh if you get these people if, if you're going to be asked uh sorry if you're going to be doing an interview with somebody for a magazine and this is a big star it's most likely that the editor will be the one or your editor at that magazine who will get that for you and i got here i underlined this i got writing about an artist is often a balance between what you want to know yourself about him or her when you're writing and what ma what the magazine you're writing for wants to know and what the readers want to know there's all of these balls to juggle in the air my favorite thing with um, interviews is trying to get them to talk about the things they normally don't like talking about same when I'm writing a biography I want to find fill in those missing links I don't want to just retell the story over and over though sometimes the magazine that you're writing for might want you to do that 
But nonetheless, there might be a time along the road where you can use that interview again in another context. And you have that information because you sit, sat down and got that person that you're speaking to, this artist, to reveal things that are really of importance to you, and that make sense. I don't mean gossip. Gossip's fun now and then. But what I mean is the stuff that motivates and makes them. What is at the core of that human being that makes this music that you love so much or you're so interested in or maybe hate so much? You can also do artists, interviews with artists you don't like. So I think that the artist always um, senses when you're bluffing and you don't know what you're talking about. You, if you ask the same questions that you asked the person before, you know, the artist before, they know that. So I would say just make, to make them relax, do that. And when I do it, I do actually write down questions and I have them with me in the room, but I don't tend to consult them. They're there in case of complete like madness. I've forgotten what I'm doing there in the first place, but it makes also the artist feel that you've made an effort. You know, you've tried to find things about them. Or if there's an awkward silence or something, as you've said to them, isn't so pleasing to them, it gives you a chance to leaf through the papers and do that. Well, I'm looking at my watch because I try to divide this into parts. And so I would not kind of ramble too much onto one part. So I move on to the next part, which is that the model of journalism that I grew up in it's changed. Of course, it changed in the same way that the music business changed, hugely, massively changed over time, sometimes in conjunction with each other. And certainly right now, what is affecting the music business and what is affecting music journalism as a, a kind of art and career is pretty much identical. But there were changes anyway. There was changes um, I noticed them, these changes in the music business coming along in the 80s. By that time, I'd been writing about music for 10 years. And I think the, probably the start of it was MTV coming along. When MTV came, suddenly we saw bands over and over again. But there was a visual, a new element to music. It, it also, as I was, when I was young, and when I was a, a beginner as a music writer, it was all audio, really. Yes, you went to see them live and you do live reviews, but you had this piece of vinyl. You sat there and you absorbed it, absorbed it. You played it to death because you literally could with an LP. It, those grooves could be killed and wiped out and you'd have to buy another version of it, as I did with some of my early much-loved albums. But... Uh, so um, along came this visual thing where people made these expensive videos and the record business had the money to pay for those. So you got the kind of new wave bands with all their bright, shiny colors and their glam. And even heavy metal at that time was the big stuff that was coming along was the glam metal of LA, the boys with the look and the makeup and the high heeled shoes. So there was this visual thing. And also there was this kind of, glossification I've made up that word this glossying of the actual record you didn't get an LP anymore which could get tatty and scratched and get its own character it was CDs and CDs were in what they call jewel boxes jewel boxes that you put your jewelry in so there was this kind of new thing this kind of visual thing that came with it, it was quite surprising and some of the magazines started to change. And there'd be magazines that came along in the UK, like Q Magazine and Smash Hits, which again had that color and the glossy paper instead of the stuff with the ink that would come off on your hands and actually double as coal if you couldn't afford the eyeliner at the time. And so um, I think that that style also began to change a little bit in the rock magazines. There was... Oh, you know, they seem to be a little bit more kind of band friendly and oh, big band friendly, big name friendly. There was a lot of kind of still sarcasm going on and, and things, but uh, it did change a little bit. But also what was happening at this time, which is curious, is that the daily newspapers, regular newspapers, 
were suddenly seeming to write about music. In the past, they'd do it if it was, say, somebody like uh, Leonard Cohen or Bob Dylan, but they didn't tend to write about music scenes and stuff, but that was changing. So there was a lot more information coming out into the world and a lot more choices or chances, really, for, for music journalists. I kind of put one of my complaints about those magazines is that somehow or other, there seemed to be less freedom for music journalists to write what they wanted to. Back in the days of writing for sounds, I remember one of my interviews was so long that they ran it over two weeks. You know, that's not going to happen now. From that time on, you started getting more word counts as opposed to approximate things like, oh, write a couple of pages. And so we kind of went along with that. But the biggest change, and this is hardly news, you can all yawn and go, mm -hmm, was the digital revolution. I mean, that was, ah, that was strange because the music business up till pretty much well, way into the 90s even, was overflowing with money. It was so rich. And then along came Napster. And we had Metallica kind of fighting Napster. And then all of these other file sharing media were coming in. And it was like, uh, there's this game called Whack-A-Mole in America where a mole comes out and you have to keep knocking it. <laughs> then another one comes out. In the end, the music business, I think, spent more time doing lawsuits, trying to keep things the same than they did to find a good model of working out how to make albums cheaper. Once people could access those albums without going to a record shop and buying them, there were also people who said, well, you know, I've got this album, it's got 10 songs on it, and I only like two of them, it, and they're not singles, they've not been released as singles. So people started being much more, I know, in a way, I wouldn't say that they were being greedy, they were more being particular about how they were going to spend their money. And the new services that were coming up with iTunes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, were kind of giving them the ability to do that. So this was a whole new thing going on. With me, I guess in England, my only way of listening to music or the music I loved had been two, two things. One of them was a thing called pirate radio. Oh, I loved pirate radio. In London, um, there were these uh, radio stations that had British people running them, but they were out at sea because the BBC, which was a corporation that I guess ran all of the airwaves, I'm not sure if I'm exactly right about the terms, in that they uh, they ha they had to be at sea, you know, they, to play the music. And you sat at home with a transistor radio kind of glued to your ear when you were meant to be sleeping or at school sometimes if you could sneak it in and just listen to these fantastic songs that didn't make their way, way onto the very few more mainstream uh, radio shows that we had. So this was one way. Another way was going into a record shop and you go into a little booth and they would put an album on very carefully and you got to hear it there. But so suddenly everybody was able to hear music, whatever they wanted to, just by going online and finding it. The thing that got difficult was that, I guess because everybody spent so much money on buying computers, because you have to keep buying upgrades for them, or rather buying upgraded ones, or because of the cost of Wi-Fi going through the roof and everything, they didn't want to pay for music. There was a small group of, I think, or probably a medium-sized group of people who didn't mind buying music or even liked physical copies. But generally speaking, the income for music business pretty much disappeared and they didn't really do much to do it. So the notes that I put here was that some people argue that because people now wanted music for free, not for LPs or CDs they might have saved up and worked for, 
that, that music in general lost a lot of its value because you could just watch it anywhere. Uh, and there were other factors, I guess. When I was a teenager, um, music was really the only, the only viable culture around, the only choice for anybody who wanted to find something, and a culture they identified with. It was the only cool culture, if you like. Whereas here, it's part of so many things that are going on. I mean, from computer games to you name probably far more than I can off of the back of my head. What became a little sad is that, as I say, that kind of undervaluation of music is something that I have noticed. And I really do feel is true. And that also, that undervaluation of music coincided or led to or was symbiotic with uh, also an undervaluation of writing. Um, I think it just, the written word in recent years just seems to have lost its luster. And I adore the written word because that from the age I was and my taste was really what I had. I love to write. I love to read books. I don't like to sit in front of a screen particularly that much, though these days I do. But I think that um, nowadays, especially with like phones where people are texting and using emojis and getting, you know, typoed words or getting the, the machine, the, you know, the artificial, artificial intelligence in there to tell you what you want to write or what you should be saying, that has cheapened the word, in my view. So how do we get there into a world where music journalism makes sense? Maybe it isn't going to be the written word. This breaks my heart to know, but, you know, I kind of was writing a few things online. Or it was last year and the year before for, um, a, I better not name it, a kind of online blog that did pay and that wanted me to write stuff about uh, music documentaries. And at the stop, top, you know, when they printed what I wrote, at the top it would say things like five-minute read or seven-minute read or ten-minute read. I see that quite a lot now when I'm looking at articles. And it again fills me with the kind of horror that that uh, email from the magazine asking me to pay to get a good review pretty much was uh, doing. It feels so wrong to me. It, but I guess maybe it's true that there is a a different kind of attention span now with people who read things online is much easier to read in a you know in a book tweets I guess Twitter became famous just because people didn't really want that many words they like the picture or they like the link to something that they can listen to but you know the long form article and interview does still exist um, sometimes behind a paywall, like, you know, with um, Mojo magazine and with uh, Rolling Stone magazine. It's the only way that they can pay writers to do these long form articles that will take weeks to write because they're more than just say one interview going. on. The other thing that's changed as well is that when I was a young writer, there were hardly any books about music or not any books that you would want to read or about any musicians I was interested in. But as that time, the 70s for me was the golden age of journalism. I think that probably right now it's the golden age of music books. There's been um, various series of books. Um, I've contributed to many of them. It's called like, let's take, say for example, Joni Mitchell on Joni Mitchell or uh, Tom Waits on Tom Waits or Johnny Cash on Johnny Cash, where a publishing company gets uh, an editor to bring together people to write or to give some previous writing they had for these books. You have a collection of hopefully great writing or great writers on these people. There's um, other series like the 33 and the third series, which are these fairly small books, but they are dedicated to one usually album by one artist. So the long form is out there and it's one of the ways that, you know, music journalists are still making their living. Um, 
I, you know, I started writing biographies, I guess my first one was probably in the, no, the first one was in the late eighties or nineties. So I, I have written biographies. My most recent was, uh, of course, the Leonard Cohen book, <laughs> my big one. It's had about 30 translations, I'm really happy to say. And uh, also most recently was um, Face It with Debbie Harry, which was a kind of collaboration, which is usually referred to as kind of ghost writing, which is another way that uh, music journalists who are suffering from the lack of work on magazines are getting. So I think it's just seemed to have switched into another direction. And I think amongst people now who are doing music writing online, it seems that they've taken a different approach. Maybe I'm wrong and you can tell me this in the Q&A part if I am, but a lot of people are now making it more kind of multimedia, by which I mean they're using podcasts as well as maybe writing and, uh, and or YouTube videos. There's a way of presenting it, as I say, in a sort of slightly sad gulp, which might have something to do with the cold and might have something to do with the subject, that it's not somebody writing these words, but speaking these words, but at least it's getting the word out. And hopefully, you know, there you can find a lot more of these niche things or underrated musicians, rather than having it as part of the big publicity machine. <clears throat> so many magazines of music have gone Q, which was the magazine that Mojo was a spin-off has gone. Sounds, which was the magazine that Kerrang, another magazine I loved to write for in my metal years in LA. That was, that's gone. Kerrang's still there. So there are a few still out there. And uh, let me see. Oh yeah, I, I made a few notes of things that were going on. Somebody, uh, I, I put something on my Facebook day before yesterday, I think it was. And I just said like, um, I, I was going to be talking on this symposium. And uh, I was wondering what my fellow music journalists thought about, you know, the future of music journalism. And, uh, oh, there was hundreds of responses. I'm going to leave them up on my Facebook page. And uh, it's sylvie.simmons.9 Facebook. I don't know who the other eight Sylvie Simmonses are or what they're writing about. But I'll leave it up and make it public so you can see because there's so many in-depth answers. There's a few people moaning, as I would guess, but a lot of people with very astute things to say. And one of the people who left a message told me, actually, this is brilliant, he's, um, he's very tech savvy, and he said he asked AI, he went to artificial intelligence and asked them the question. So let me see where I've got it from. I will have, yes, here it is. They, it's, this is what AI says. This is what the internet says about it. One possible development is that music journalists will become more, more, sorry, music journalism will become more focused on providing in-depth analysis and commentary on the music industry, rather than just reporting on the latest music releases and events. This could include examining the business economic aspects of the industry, as well as exploring the cultural and social imp impact. So they're kind of taking the middle line. This is interesting and a bit scary. Another potential trend is that music journalism will become more personalized and interactive with journalists using technology to engage directly with their readers and provide a more immersive and personalized experience. This could include using virtual and augmented reality to create interactive content. That's the bit that I probably caught the cold because of reading that line or using machine learning algorithms to recommend articles and music based on individual preferences. Well, everything is splintered right now into a trillion pieces, and it's probably good. Maybe it's even a phase that people uh, are kind of wanting everything aimed personally at them. It's it kind of reminds me when I was a kid and there was like three TV stations in England and two of them were from the BBC. Everybody saw the same programs and everybody spoke about them and had an opinion. And so there was this kind of communal culture. Um, 
it was the same with music. You know, a Van Morrison album would come out and it's like, oh my God, everybody who loved music would get a Van Morrison album or find a way of hearing it. And so these kind of debates would go on a very kind of, I don't know, it was almost a meta level. Now it's very microscopic. And the only time where there seems to be these kind of massive cultures are unfortunately in the sort of culture wars that are going along certainly in the US and in the UK I'm not so sure about maybe where you happen to be but people are kind of have got a team team politics where in the past it would be team TV or, or team uh, music uh, what I put down here was like uh, look, making a living now how to make a living from writing it is hard. I got um, a note from LinkedIn. I don't remember if somebody joined me up and I've never done anything with it. But they offered me a job at 10 cents a word. Uh, if you're going to write something like that, so that means probably a three days work, you will get $100, which out here will just about buy you dinner. Uh, so that's not such a good idea, really. But there are places that you can make at least a name, you know, some people, if you're already famous, can probably make make a living. But if you're making a start in this, you can also use these as a way of getting into music journalism. There's things like Substack, where you're basically running your own newspaper, which is edited by you, written by you. <laughs> and it's kind of like the fanzines, where anybody who was old enough to remember the fanzines that they put out in New York and in London, you know, and other parts of England for, for kind of rock and punk and stuff. So um, I'm finding that that's a, a way of doing it. Um, really, most of the ways of getting into it, you just get paid by a kind of tip jar that's online. Um, and I kind of... Uh, one of the things I think may change, though, and one is good, is that there is now so many different kinds of people writing online. It's, you know, there really was a kind of boys club for music journalism back in the days. Obviously, there were women that broke into that and were doing that and doing very well at it. But now it's, it's so diverse. I read this by people who are writing about subjects and music that I never knew anything about. And I could really like spend days going down rabbit holes and everything and on YouTube to do that. But I'm still writing for print journalism. Um, as for veteran writers like myself, I mentioned, there's several other ways to earn extra money through writing in a world of music. Uh, one of the things I made it from was writing liner notes for albums. And these days, uh, a lot of music businesses around what they call the catalogue, you know, music that came out before that's being reissued with um, bonus tracks and all these things. These are uh, box sets and everything that are coming out. You get to sometimes work on writing for them or you curate them. You're a person who will put together the, the greatest hits or this, that and the other. So you get this. This is a wonderful thing, too. Um, let me see. I think at this point, I'll see if there's anything on here I didn't get to, but no, nope, I think I'm here. Oh, yeah, I have a happy moment at the end. What I wrote is, I said, future of rock writing. Well, it's still here. It's kind of still, I think, the, the Wild West when it comes to the music business and the internet, you know, it opened wide up. Everybody's still madly in love with it, trying to work out what to do with it, but mostly just sucked into it and using it moment after moment. But really, the dust is going to settle. Things are going to change. Several people that wrote about what the future of music was when I asked them said, well, the thing is, there isn't that much great music going on right now. I don't know, a lot of people will probably object to hearing that, but I know there is a lot of disposable music going on. And that thing I mentioned about nothing sticking around, you need something new every few seconds to feed the machine, to feed the content machine, to sell the ads for these platforms that are using a lot of this writing. But as long as there is good, interesting, life-changing music there, there's going to be good, or at least a need for good, life-changing, serious rock writing and music writing. 
So I think really there's some optimism at the end. As I say, go and see the whole list at the end on my on my uh, personal Facebook page, which I'll make public for a few days, and you'll get an idea of it. This hope is a strange time right now, but hey, I'm still right in, and I look forward to you doing it too. And of course, any ideas that you might have to give me, because you might know more than I do about where it's going to go. So if you will allow me just to take uh, a sip of hot tea, as a good English person, and get my voice back, I'd be happy to open this up for questions and answers on whatever subject you like, my books, my writing, writing in general, the mistakes you think I might have made in the in my talk, or what I might have left out. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Sylvie. I would suggest uh, that people can place their questions to the chat window. If you can see that, you can you can you can check your uh, screen, and there's a little little button where people yeah. can place questions if if they like to ask you something. Thank you for the talk; it was wonderful. Thank you so much. Let's see how many questions we can get. Should I open that up? Uh, yeah, just open open the chat window. Yes, mm -hmm. and. You should be having there uh, a button where it, it should it should be saying everyone. That means like everyone who's connected to this session is able to place to raise a question. Okay, right now I see um, a few names on there. Do you want me to open those up? Uh, the names are just showing you the people that are that are connected to this to this session. At the moment, it's eighteen people in. Okay, so is there um, any way uh, I'll know that if they're getting in touch to ask a question? Yeah, I think I think they can hear us, and uh, if they if they want, they can write something in the chat. Let's let, we can wait a little. If someone is coming in, jumping in, I also during your during your talk, I shared with with those guys with everyone uh, the links to your to your web page to your um to your wikipedia profile and also i shared the link to the translation of your wonderful book on leonard cohen that came out here in czech republic i just want to remind everyone that this is a this is a event that is taking place as as, as promoted by meat factory which is a, a center center of contemporary art in Prague. My name is Václav. I work as the musical director there, and this is this is uh, this uh, event is uh, part of the event series called Synapse Knowledge, which is a which is a series of events to educate uh, with music and different 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 uh, parts of the musical world. And thank you so much, Sylvie, for being part of this. This one, it's the last event of this year. It's been great hearing you talking. And uh, it seems like there's no question yet. Ah, well, it's always hard for somebody to come up with the first one. I can tell you what I used to be asked all the time. And I would be asked to write write articles on it. And those articles, when I uh, when I did write one or two, were quite venomous when I wrote them. And it was like, what's it like to be a girl in rock? Or as I got older, what's right, it like right. to be a woman in rock? And, you know, it really was, well, how the hell would I know what it was like to be a man or a person of another gender in rock? I only know about what it is to be a woman. But I understand what they were meaning at a time when a lot of music was dominated by male bands, especially in the world of music which I loved most of all and I think that there were some some points of it that were a little kind of hard to tackle in the beginning in the sense that you did tend to see a few people kind of walking around with less clothing on than you thought they might have in an interview but that ended very quickly because I was writing for first of all one weekly magazine and it grew to magazines in Germany uh, in uh, where else was I writing in America with cream and 
and with a rocking, uh, what was it, uh, music life festival in Japan. I had all of these different columns everywhere. And, and I just said, well, you know, I wouldn't do it if I was you because I get to write about it. <laughs> and I, I won't be very complimentary. So in the end, they realize that you're not going to go away and that you're there pretty much they're stuck with you as an interviewer you're the LA correspondent for all these magazines it kind of changes and so it's a much different kind of vibe going on and I think actually it might have worked in my favor in the sense of a novelty that when I first was doing interviews in LA before I was you know now I should say, I'll just stick with that sentence before I go off on a different way. Um, when I was doing those, the usual way of an interview was that the record company would hire a hotel room or a place. And then whoever was being granted interviews would come along like half an hour before they were due. They would go in, do their 45 minutes or an hour talking to somebody, get out. And then the guy gets a cup of tea or something or a beer. And then in you come, the next one comes. So there were, this was the way of doing it. And there would be all of these, I guess, white hetero guys, you know, with their glasses on doing their questions. And then along would come this kind of little thing with dyed black spiky hair, you know, looked about 12, who was asking them questions about their music. So I think that there was probably that was, that gave me, I, I guess, a sort of slight edge over some people when it came to interviews. But otherwise, I mean, it was... I didn't really kind of notice the kind of male female thing probably because I was brought up with brothers I was a father's girl and I have brothers no sisters so to me being around guys seemed normal and writing about them seemed perfectly normal and and funnily enough amongst the metal heavy metal people were probably the nicest to me than <laughs> any of the other artists when it came to you know not trying to point out that I was a girl and that they thought I might have other uses than writing about them. So we've got the, the first question, Sylvie, is what is the most difficult interview in your life? The most difficult? <clears throat> I can tell you the most difficult, that one I didn't get, <laughs> or it's two that I didn't get that I wanted, which were Dylan and John Lennon, but just because John Lennon died before I could get to the interview. Um, but the most difficult was probably Lou Reed. Um, I'd mentioned I think when I talked about Frank Zappa being difficult Zappa was very difficult because he hated journalists he told me this and he hated English journalists I asked him why the English and he said because he'd played a show in London and that somebody pulled him off stage you know and I, said, well, I just said well it wasn't me I guess I was quite childlike in my early interview days but he gave me a pretty nasty interview but then he felt bad about it and the a uh, record company called me up and said, he's asked you over to his place, you know, and he's got a home studio. He'll do the interview again there. So I went over there and I met his wife and his kids, you know, and, and was in his studio and did a, another interview. After that, decades, a couple of decades later, for Mojo magazine, I interviewed Lou Reed and he was, oh my God. It actually made me laugh during the interview because he was so awful. And that was a sad thing because I love Lou Reed. I love Velvet Underground. Only just recently I went to the exhibition in New York and sat there all by myself in the room where you could have metal machine music playing around you, sense around, you know, sitting there listening with 12 speakers, I think it was. So I loved him. There were things I wanted to know. And I think that they were intelligent questions and insightful questions. And he approved me coming on the grounds that he liked my Serge Gansborg book that I wrote about this French musician songwriter. But what he was was being completely, just a complete shithead, really. There's no other way of putting it. Uh, I couldn't even get a full sentence out in the interview. He wouldn't let me get there. He would answer something that he imagined I asked. So, yeah, that was the most difficult. And in the end of the day, I found it quite funny. I actually at the end said to him, you know, as I think we told you, this is a Q&A interview. And therefore, <laughs> would you like us just to start again? You know, we got off on the wrong foot. I don't know. Do you want me to come back and do it? Do you want to do it by phone? And he said, no. So clearly he wanted to present himself that way.
Thank you. So another question is, Sylvie, uh, do you have another biography planned? I kind of have my sort of secret what to do at some point one. So I can't say what it is. Is It's a secret and it might scare the person. Oh, I've got to keep it quiet for now. Yeah, I think um, when I did the Leonard Cohen book, that was such a labor of love. You know, I had uh, first heard Leonard Cohen when I was a little girl, you know, in London, living with my mom and dad and listening to the Beatles. And uh, I'd heard him on a compilation album that came out. Brilliant things. They were the same cost as a 45. So they were cheap as anything. And this had all these American, well, and Canadian, I guess, article, uh, uh, music rather selections of people like Bob Dylan and Leonard Cohen. And there was something about that voice that those words that were so mysterious kept drawing me back and whatever it was, it was like nothing I'd ever heard before and really, really moved me. So that book became, as I say, a labor of love. I'd interviewed him as a music journalist. One was a three day interview in London for a mojo, went back every day to do some more talking. And I realized with that, he'd actually sort of blown the smoke in my eyes sometimes because he's so charming and so articulate. You don't realize he's kind of articulated himself around the honest answer. And so I approached him to do um, a book. And he, after, I guess, some consideration, gave me his support. He also had liked my search against book book. So yeah, I'll do another one, but that took me years. And I guess I have to put another three years aside if I want to do this other person. So it's really a case of finding someone that you love, who you've, who's got a few books on them already, but maybe they don't really tell you what you want to know, or there's these missing gaps. I'm always so fascinated with the missing gaps. Like uh, that's why I really, you know, with the Leonard Cohen book, wanted to speak to a lot of not all the women, like all of the girlfriends of Leonard Cohen, but those who played a serious role in his life, because I thought there's all this time to stop doing anything, what happens? Well, they would know. And then I could go to him and say, this is what I heard. Does that sound about right? You know, and he'd go, yes or no. Mm. Thank you, Sylvie. There's another question. Uh, and... Uh... Gabriela is asking about your impression of the Keith Richards uh, audio uh, the, uh, the biography book. How how it, how it was your impression? Did I like it? Oh, it was one of the best of the music autobiographies, you know. I'm sure there was some help involved, but I'm not going to be the magician who shows you how to get the hat and the rabbit out of the hat. But um, yeah, it was good. It really captured his voice, his way of speaking. I've interviewed Keith a few times and he is quite remarkable because, you know, he is, he was, he looks exactly like the old pirate and you ask him a question and it's at the end, you know, and he's smoking his cigarette. But he has the most marvelous memory. I've spoken to Mick Jagger many times too. He doesn't really much remember anything, but the previous press release but he says that he'll admit to it he won't come up and beat me up for this but Keith remembered everything so it's really interesting isn't it that uh, you'd think with his intake of various substances that his brain might have been wiped out but no it's been preserved in some sort of wonderful amber for the rest of eternity and I think you know in the next century from now we'll be listening to Keith telling us his stories so it was a very good thing it captured him that's really what you want to get from from the uh, autobiographies like tell the story you know and he was so cheeky about you know riling Mick you know to dig, getting the trigger points and poking them because the two of them they were kind of like some old married couple, really. You know, they're arguing all the time, but this kind of need for each other, this kind of symbiotic relationship that was both love and hate and did break up at one point because I remember interviewing each of them individually when they were doing their solo stuff. So, yeah, good old Keith Richards. It was one of my favorite autobiographies for sure. Fantastic. Another, are you, are you still, are you still okay up for some more questions? How do you feel? I have some tea. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just let, let me know when, when. Uh... 
They're good questions, and these have all been good questions. Nice. I hope they like the answers. If not, tell them they can get back to me and say, hey. <laughs> so another one is, <laughs> is there a question you wish journalists would ask you? Being a musician, also uh, as, as a writer? That's a really smart question. The smart questions are the ones that everybody answers. That's a really good question, but I'm just going to say it's a smart question. It's probably something I'd have to sit and think about, but if you give me your email, I'll try and come back to you on it. But kind of not really. I think that was more of a question I wanted to ask myself about becoming a musician. I was kind of terrified, to be honest, when I signed with Light in the Attic. They signed me. I didn't really go to them. It was... Uh, a musician, a music writer friend of mine was playing my demos and they heard it in the background on the phone when they were talking to him. And it turned out in the end that they signed me because they thought I sounded like some long lost in the attic uh, 60s folk singer or whatever. And I loved that. That's what I wanted to be in the 60s for heaven's sake, but I didn't have the, the age or the, the ability to do it back then. So I think I was upset, well, not upset, I was anxious because in England, especially if um, music journalists become uh, musicians, that's breaking, it's like stepping over some impossible boundary, it's breaking the golden rule. And when uh, Light in the Attic announced it was coming out, I thought, well, I've got to mention I have an album now. And I hadn't up until that point. And I just thought I was going to get crucified, you know, but uh, actually I got all very, very good reviews. And I was even by, it was a lovely one in The Guardian where he said, I should hate this because she's a music journalist and she's playing a ukulele. These are two things that are very damning. And he said it was one of the most beautiful albums of the year. So I couldn't really argue on that. So in a way, my question to myself would have been, why did you wait until you were in your 50s? And the reason was because I realized when I was in my 50s, shit I'm going to be in my 60s I can't be a singer songwriter for the first time in my 60s so it really was one of those kind of almost whimsical things like the reason for becoming a singer songwriter in the first place and uh, not really having any real plans but just I've got to do it I'm writing songs my musician friends seem to like them and so I need to do this and uh, and get on stage and not be frightened anymore it was scary in the beginning but you get used to it. Wonderful. Uh, another question is, do you still have any dream interviews? Dream in? Interviews. In dream interviews. Still Bob Dylan. I got close. Um, I was, uh, arranged, there was, it was arranged for me to talk to him out in Italy. I was living in, back in London at the time, so it wasn't that far away. And they uh, they were giving such difficult conditions for this interview. I mean, it's not a case with a lot of interviews with the big stars where you just walk in the room. Like, for example, with the um, with the Lou Reed thing, there was lots of advance backwards and forwards between my magazine editors and the publicists and Lou and all that stuff before there was an approval. And this was going on with this interview that we were going to have with um, Dylan, but it turned out that the conditions were that I would only get 15 minutes, which they put up to 20 minutes with him alone. And the rest would be what they call a round table, which is a sort of like a press conference, but it has one person from pretty much each country, like an important magazine or newspaper who covers music in there. And so as this was going to be for a monthly magazine I wrote for, I kind of was talking with the editor and we agreed that what would happen is that the people who were in there on daily papers would put this out and then sell it on a syndication agencies under a pseudonym so that other magazines would have the same as we had mostly. And as they wanted a cover story from it, you know, those conditions to get these things, we decided reluctantly to say no to Bob Dylan. But if he's listening to this, Bob, love you. <laughs> I do. Maybe not as much as Leonard, you know, but I love you and I would love to talk to you and, and sit there and have a real conversation. Because these days, 
Dylan isn't being that cryptic, joking person as much. I mean, he's still a, strict, a trickster with the uh, Scorsese films. You know, he um, was making up things, you know, having Sharon Stone in a role and, and stuff. He's always been the trickster, but he now tells the truth about the music he loves. And this new book he's just put out. Wonderful. It's just him acting like exactly like an old school music journalist, full of hyperbole saying, this is the best, this is the worst. So yeah, I want Dylan. Dylan, come on over. I'll let you play my ukuleles. Good luck on that. I would love to read it. Oh, another question. Are you ready if someone will write the book about you? I've been had people like publishers say you should write um, your memoir. No, I don't want to. I, I kind of prefer like music journalists when they get together we've all got war stories you know we've all got these amazing stories and uh most of them are completely outrageous and would probably get the person involved usually not the music journalist arrested so that i kind of prefer that having these stories that are more kind of private i think if i was to tell the entire truth about some of the things that would go on it would just get so many people into trouble <laughs> And I also, even though I have to um, be much more involved in self-promotion because of being a musician and everything, and because that's the way it is now, I have to admit, I kind of cringe every time I have to do it. Like, hey, would you guys check out my band camp? Or, hey, I've got my albums on special offer. Even saying it here, it's kind of making me tight in the chest it's it's something I don't like doing so I would feel that that was just being a book link showing off wouldn't really feel that nice okay okay thank you and let's uh, sh shall we make this this is this is the last question actually from Gabriella what are your favorite songs to play on the ukulele my songs <laughs> yeah the most of them are my songs i mean when i got a ukulele uh, i should say how i got the ukulele i came out to uh san francisco on a whim really i sold up my place in london i'd been there for 10 years that the last time came to san, uh, san francisco and i put all my um instruments in storage i learned classical piano and clarinet as a kid and i played a guitar in my teens and stuff and uh, I met this guy who was learning this, I was doing a documentary on a, on, on ukuleles. And uh, he came over and he left his ukulele at my place one night in this sort of notation. I couldn't work it out really, but by the next day I was playing it. He asked me if I could play it. I said, no, but he came over to pick it up and I played in this kind of whole jazz thing. And he said, he said you, you lied, you lied. I said, why? He said, you said you couldn't play. I said, I couldn't and I can now. And uh, he got so mad at me, he gave me my own ukulele, which was a good result. And so I had that ukulele and I just fell for it. And I started writing songs seriously on it. And it sounds a strange thing because it's not considered other than by the late George Harrison uh, and Paul, oh, not late, thankfully, Paul McCartney, a serious instrument um, amongst the rock world. It was something that I found such an intimate instrument because you hold it close. You're doing it quietly because it's, you know, it's a very quiet instrument that it somehow suited my mood and my kind of songs I like. I always liked the B-sides, which were kind of sadder than the A-sides when I bought singles. And so uh, I kind of wrote the songs. They just all came out. It really was like Paul McCartney talks about, uh, you know, let it be, you know, one of those songs, you wake up with it and it's there. I was actually awake with it, with a bottle of wine on the floor. And these songs came out and I did the album and I, I just continued and I hope get better with writing those songs. But, you know, I don't tend to do too many covers on it. If I do, it's just some random one uh, that has just come into my head because my head is so full of songs and music after years of all these album reviews and album collecting and album, album owning and now album writing. I think probably for my album, my probably my favorite one with writing was You Are In My Arms because, well, it has a lot of fancy chords, but which you can do very easily on a uke, I should say. But that one was one that was unlike anything 
of the others that I'd really written. It had a kind of sitting on the beach at sundown in Hawaii feel. And it was almost like my tribute to the ukulele as an instrument, as well as being a, a kind of bit of a heartbreaker. So that's You Are In My Arms. I think it's a couple of places you can see it for free online. Thank you. Sylvie, uh, may I ask whether your, your um, uh, perspective on music changed since you started playing your own music? Or, I mean, like your style of writing, has it changed at all? I think um, my style of writing, I guess my natural, un, you know, I just leave, nobody can stop me writing what I want things uh, in my books. That is my natural sight. Uh, Uh, style of writing I you know I had a publisher of my Leonard Cohen book and I'm going to say even if it gets me into trouble he was a pain in the butt and he didn't like my writing particularly but I wouldn't change it and I fought to keep what I wrote so this is exactly my style and and it's kind of matured in age as I suppose the ego goes down a little bit and the sort of psyche comes up a little bit more kind of really wants to examine this music that just came past me in this conveyor belt, which is how it is as a music journalist or was, where you get sent so many new records or nowadays streams every day to listen to. So maybe it's a little more reflective, a little more mature. Um, the only thing that changes it is really editors, they don't change the words so much as they give you a much stricter kind of word count. So. These days, a lot of the reviews I do are shorter than I would like. You know, they tend to be kind of capsules. And I would really love sometimes just to be able to really go on and give it the space that it requires. But otherwise, I think I'm the same. I still adore music. If I hear something new that um, blows me away, it's it, it really, as I said, that blows me away. It really does. There's some real physical reaction. Like, wow. I've got to keep playing this. A friend send me stuff and, you know, sometimes it's their music and other times it's just like I heard this person and I've never heard of them and they can gloat over the music journalist who never heard of this person. But it's some unknown person and you think, yeah, I want to see where this person's going. Can't always these days write about them as I could in the old days of weeklies where you could, whatever your obsession or your new love was, whoever you adored, you could write about But at some point, if I can find a way, I, maybe I'll put up a sub stack if I can get enough people to, to uh, say, yeah, we'll actually go on it. That's one of the big problems of the internet. It's wonderful, everything's out there, but it's so, so vaporized into atoms that, you know, sometimes you're going to be just talking to an audience of one. And sometimes it feels so sad that you just think, no, I'll just sit at home and do other writing. I also write short stories. And they're pub I had a few published in um, in Canada, and they're very different to my other short stories. And I write poetry as well. So writing and music, that's it. And there's no time for anything except the occasional cup of tea in between. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So we do feel uh, to answer some more questions. If there's, if there's good questions, I'll try and give yeah. them. There's two more for what I see. The first mm -hmm. is, what is the key to lead a successful interview outside of good preparation? Oh, there have been times when I, I've been landed. You know, it's a last minute thing and you're going to have to go backstage. But the secret of that is confidence, really. Confidence in the fact that you're going to be talking to them. Um Just if you have researched and just try and get the, you, you can go into some sort of like some very, I'm trying basic questions, you know, like the reason you're talking to them likely is because they maybe they would just put an album out and they're on tour with the album. Just say, you know, I'm really curious, you know, was there like one thing that happened between now and the last album hopefully you'll remember what the name of that one is if you're not even prepared you know something that happened before you did this album you know did you like kind of wash the entire plates clean and like go in a dip? tell me tell me about that you know tell me how that that process went down and usually then because it's something they're interested in it's a new album they'll say a lot unless they're Lou Reed and they'll just be rude to you 
but they'll tell you a lot. And when they're doing that, as you're listening, as you should be, and recording for purposes of transcribing, it's hard to write and listen at the same time. You've got another part of your brain, probably the left side, is going to be trying to gather as much information as it can. It's like an instant police interview. You've got, it's not the band of the police, who are very good to interview, I have to admit. But there's um, this part of you that is listening for where you can go next. If they say nothing, you can actually say to them, yeah, you know what, that was really interesting. If it was just, they just come off of stage, you know, I loved what you did in that one. That's one of the new songs. Hopefully you'll get that right. And so just start it with that. Try and some, get something specific and vague at the same time. It's like, I don't know, it's all a bit kind of zen, <laughs> contemplating two opposites. You don't know, you'll pretend you know. And somehow as you get on and they start talking, you respond. As I say, I'd have questions when I go in to interview them, but the likelihood of me using them is about one in 200. And so it would be, I would be going from what they said. And I would remember that something was in there. Or I might just say, if I wanted a break from it, hey, let me just look at this paper for a minute, because I know I wanted to ask you about something specific. And they're happy. And you can look through it and find that. But yeah, if you're not prepared, just act as if you are. And just be very sharp. You have all of your faculties trying to work out what you can get. And it may not be a great interview. I ran into Neil Young once. It was a, a party for, it was in seven, must have been 1978, nine. Somebody will tell me. He had done the, um, that film he had done, this little eco film that Devo were in. And he had sort of taken himself away from the party, which was held in a garage, this kind of car place in, in Beverly Hills. And he was hiding and he saw me and he hid even further. He tried to hide behind a car. And I, I went up to him and I said, you can't hide from me. He said, no. And so I started talking to him and it was really quite funny. He just don't tell anyone I'm here, I think was his opening thing. I said, and so I got even something from that. He said, okay, where are you then? You know, where would you like to be? Where were you just before this? And you could just use that little tiny bit of um, something into a conversation. And you're just not looking at him too fiercely or anything. So he's going to run away. Thank you. And Sylvie, the last question is, do you have a favorite music related book or biography? Or, and also, who's your uh, favorite author? Oh, my favorite author just changes all the time, except for Shakespeare. I, I'm such a Shakespeare nut. <laughs> I really am completely and utterly Shakespeare mad. And, uh, but for uh, books, how can I pick out just one? I think one that I really loved, even though I wrote a book about the same person, Uh, was um, shaky, Jimmy McDonough's book on Neil Young, who I just mentioned. I know that Jimmy had taken on this job, of, it, his was, I think, a 10-year job, if I remember rightly, of pretty much being the official biographer. No, not even pretty much. He was the official biographer of Neil. Followed Neil around, spoke to him, spoke to his mom, spoke to his You know, everything. I mean, it was sort of thoroughness that I was doing with my Leonard Cohen book plus because he has this Neil by his side. And then Neil, Neil is somebody who changes his mind. He's a very whimsical character. And as we know with his music, which is often brilliant and sometimes is only interesting, but he will do whatever he wants to do with whoever he wants to do it, whenever he wants to do it. And it was the same with us after 10 years. He said, I don't want to do this book anymore. And so Jimmy was left with like, what? And he did the book. I mean, despite like threats and lawsuits and who knows what else, he did the book. And what was so marvelous was about it as well is he didn't have any resentment. It was a brilliant book on Neil and covered so many aspects of his life. And I say mostly it was that he did something that I like to do with my writing And what I did with my Lena Cohen book, which is to bring the writers into the room with you, like almost like take away those walls. You're not studying an insect at the end of a microscope. You are sitting in a room with this person 
or you were these days, it's mostly Zoom since the pandemic, which is sad, but you're sitting in a room breathing the same air. You've got body languages letting you know what they're feeling and, and doing. And you want to bring the reader into that. So they kind of get somewhat to know that person. I did that with the coin book on that kind of saying, is it like a sort of small man? He's like, polite, he's shy, he pretend. You know, all of these things just like get them in with the first couple of paragraphs. And some of my articles did that. This book, Shaky, did that. So I think it's um, probably one of my, my favorite music books. Also, there was a fantastic Willie Nelson um, biography by Jonik Potowski. Again, it's somebody people have written about, but you know, this one was one of those books that you keep. And actually behind me, there's shelves and shelves and shelves of books of everybody up there. So I like that. I, I kind of like also the books where you can feel that the journalist has filled in those missing gaps that I mentioned that go on. I mean, with Leonard Cohen, it was like people wrote about him. They said, yeah, he uh, went on the road with The Future, his biggest album. And he uh, and then when the tour was over, he went and lived in a monastery for five and a half years. Right. Nobody said, what the hell? <laughs> you know, you just made your biggest album. You were engaged to Rebecca De Mornay, the beautiful actress who's got her own money, so she's not going to sue you if you divorce. There's all of these things. Nobody went and thought to actually ask Rebecca of Demone what happened or any of those things. You know, you want to find out what it was, not to be nosy about their love life, but to find out what motivated a man after all those years to finally get these, his biggest selling album and then go and live in a godforsaken place that truly was. I went and stayed there myself and be a cook and kind of secretary for a, an 88-year-old Buddhist monk and drive him around and get a sort of certificate of, you know, being able to cook for him. You know, you have to prove that you'll have good cook, uh, cooking safety or food safety things. So uh, these are the things as well that I want to put into the story and get the whole story. Thank you so much, Sylvie. This was so great. Thank you everyone again for coming. Thanks, and uh, I think this is the this was the last question we have. Oh, is there so, another one? Oh, that was the last. This, that, that was the last one, yes. Oh, that was the last one. And I got into so many answers there, I can't even remember what the question was. Did I answer the question? Ask the person if I asked, answered I think the so. I think so, yeah. Uh I, I I would like to also mention that this this has this has been recorded. And if you if you later uh, accept if, if if you agree, we, it will be published on uh, Meat Factory YouTube channel, so you guys can maybe later find it there. We'll post the link also to the Facebook event. Thank you so much again, Sylvie, for doing this, uh, and thank you everyone for coming in. I wish you the great rest of the year and wonderful Christmas, and we'll be looking forward to be seeing you somewhere else some other time warm and stay safe and keep making music and thank you, so, thank you so much for all the writings sylvie thank you bye bye bye